How often do we come across an engine that can last almost three decades and is capable of powering various types of vehicles, from daily drivers to race cars, with over 20 times the power of a standard engine? The incredible engine we're going to discuss in today's video is not only strong and durable, but has also proven to be reliable in various automotive applications, including being the choice for the most powerful Formula One cars today. So, what engine are we going to talk about in today's video? Let's get to it. The story starts with an amazing racer and engineer, Baron Alex von Falkenhausen. He designed a new inline four engine for BMW that was originally meant for everyday cars. This engine, known as the M115, started with a capacity of 1.5 liters, but could later be increased to two liters. The engine block and cylinder head were made from aluminum, which helped it to be both strong and durable. The M115 was built to last, with a robust structure including a five-bearing crankshaft and a single camshaft head driven by a chain. It also has a hemispherical combustion chamber to achieve optimal combustion efficiency. This configuration proved that BMW's racing engine had what it took. In the late 1960s, BMW tried to combine this engine with a special radial valve setup. However, it was soon scrapped because it was too complicated. Then, in the 1970s, the FIA changed the Formula 2 regulations and started allowing two-liter engines in 1972. Paul Roche led the BMW team in developing a high-speed engine that proved very successful. Jarrier's impressive victories driving the March 732 demonstrated the engine's success. The engine had titanium connecting rods and a high compression ratio of around 13 to 1. Despite its success in Formula 2, BMW didn't stop there. In the late 1970s, when Renault was dominating Formula 1 with their turbo engines, BMW faced a significant challenge. Then, BMW re-engineered the 1.4-liter turbocharged M12 engine to produce more than 550 horsepower with 2.6 bars pressure. Paul Rashi and Jan Nirpash saw the potential in this engine and started developing one for Formula 1 with new rules allowing turbo engines with a capacity below 1,500 cc. At first, BMW wanted to get Nicky Lauda on board and team up with McLaren, but that didn't happen, and the BMW board also said no to the project. However, Jochen Nierpasch and Dieter were able to convince the board to collaborate with the Brabham team. Thanks to this collaboration, they managed to boost the power of the M12 engine, which is now about seven times more powerful than the original engine. It's interesting that they didn't use special engine blocks. All these racing engines were made from original cast iron units that had already traveled over 100,000 kilometers and were considered quite old because of their imperfect condition for casting. Even worse, Russia ordered these engines to be stored outside for months. There's even a myth that employees were allowed to urinate on them. Meanwhile, other teams used twin turbo V6 and V8 engines. Brabham went a different route with a 2-liter single turbo inline 4 engine and a very strong M10 block. Since this engine only had four cylinders, it had fewer valves, was smaller in size, and had minimal friction when operating, generating less heat. This meant that Brabham chassis designer Gordon Murray could fit smaller radiators, which made the body slimmer and helped the car perform better on straight tracks. The M10 and M12 engine had cylinder dimensions of 89.2 x 60 mm which allowed it to reach an engine speed range of 9,000 to 12,000 revolutions per minute. The engine's interior is built to last, using male pistons and titanium connecting rods. The M12 had a gear-driven camshaft and a dry sump oil lubrication system. The compression ratio dropped from 13 to 1 in the non-turbo racing version to 7.1 to 1, and sometimes even lower to avoid detonation from using a high-boost turbo. This engine used a single triple K turbo. The engine initially reached 550 horsepower, then increased to 680 horsepower in 1983, and even reached 740 horsepower to 900 horsepower in racing conditions. At the time, the Brabham team, owned by Bernie Ecclestone, started out using the DFV engine, but reliability issues with the BMW engine meant they had to switch. The Brabham-BMW partnership almost fell apart due to some recurring issues with the injection and ignition systems, which were caused by some pretty intense power surges. Specifically, the engine had Bosch ignition and Kugelfischer injection systems. Of course, such a big power surge 
meant that other areas needed to be developed as well. They finally got their first win in the mid-1982 season, with Nelson Piquet driving the Brabham and BMW BT50 car in Canada. This marked the start of the turbo era and the end of the reign of naturally aspirated Formula One cars. When BMW's engine was fully utilized in the championship, Nelson Piquet won his second title in 1983, representing the peak of the Brabham-BMW collaboration. But after 1983, the car didn't do so well. It often finished in lower positions or didn't even make it to the end of the race. The turbo engines were pretty unreliable during the 1984 and 1985 seasons. Also, with the 220-liter fuel limit for races, fuel consumption was a big problem. The M12 engine used a lot of fuel to prevent detonation and to keep the engine cool. BMW got the most out of the M12 and 13 SL1 engine by installing it at a 72 degrees angle in the Brabham BT55 car, while the upright version was used by the Benetton B186. Benetton got one win in Mexico and hit 352 km per hour on the Italian track, but these weren't consistent results. During qualifying, this engine reached boost pressures of up to 5.5 bars when the wastegate was locked. In this condition, the engine delivered peak performance for only a few minutes before the risk of an engine explosion arose, which could have damaged the car. Gordon Murray said they used dry ice and water spray on the intercooler to cool the engine for a perfect qualifying lap that lasted only a few minutes. No dynamometer could accurately measure the engine's power above 1,000 horsepower. Estimates put the peak power at 1,200 to 1,300 horsepower, with some claims suggesting it could reach 1,400 horsepower. This was about 20 times the power of standard engines at the time. Just wanted to follow up on the engine discussion we had a moment ago. It's tough to wrap your head around those horsepower numbers from such a compact engine. It's also worth noting that the turbo lag is a bit of a surprise, and the throttle timing out of corners needs to be planned with precision. All things considered, we have to give Rosh a lot of credit for what he was able to build. It might look a bit plain from the outside, but it's got a lot going on inside and can produce a lot of power. That's all we have time for in this video. If you have any feedback or ideas, please leave them in the comments section below. See you in the next video, and thanks for watching.